for today. Uh, we're going to talk about Purim because it falls right smack during the week. And uh, the Lord, I think, has given me two different messages. This is more like about uh, principles. Um, like I said, the book of Purim is crazy. Just absolutely a crazy story, a crazy ride. If you want to read a crazy story, man, that's one of them. Uh, but let me, let me read something to you that I wrote down here. In, in 1980, you're familiar in 1980, uh, in the USSR, the former USSR, anti-Semitism was just horrific. They were letting none of the Jews go back to Israel. And the Jews were being persecuted in, in, in 1980, believe it or not. So in 1980, a Soviet Jew was asked by a Westerner, somebody from the States, what he thought would be the outcome if the USSR stepped up its anti-Semitic policies. Quote, Oh, probably a feast, end quote. When asked for an explanation, the Jewish man said, quote, Pharaoh tried to wipe us out, and the result was Passover. Haman tried to exterminate us, and the result was Purim. Antiochus Epiphanes tried to do us in, and the result was Hanukkah. Purim is, is one of the happiest holy days on the Jewish calendar. Now, I say the Jewish calendar. Some of you might say, well, isn't the Jewish calendar God's calendar? This is not one of the Levitical feasts. Why are you being so technical? Be because you, you need to be. Let me ask something. How many times have you been in church or you've heard somebody say, when the, when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise a standard? Has anybody ever heard that? That is not from the Bible. They're, they're misquoting the Bible. It says in 59:19 of Isaiah that the Lord, the Messiah, would come in like a flood. So they're replacing Satan for the Messiah. So you see how you have to be careful? You really should not misquote the Lord. Purim is one of the holiest days and the happiest days on the Jewish calendar. Haman, you guys weren't raised in Judaism, were you? When you hear... <laughs> yeah. Some people here, like for the first time, some devout Christians like, why are they booing him? That's not polite, <laughs> especially not here in Macon. Haman was a murderer. He had the spirit of the Antichrist. So, so when you hear his name, you know, all Jewish people know whenever you hear his name. That's why humantashen, you know, the cookies, that's Hebrew for Haman's hats. That's why we eat them. That's what, that's what I say. And, and if you're a devout Christian, you're here, and you don't understand what's going on, that's because you've put a wall between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's the Bible. It's, it's his history, his story, and it runs all the way through. You can't pick and choose what's important to you. Purim is, is one of the happiest holy days. Haman, an ancient Persian forerunner of Hitler, plotted to kill all the Jews. The Lord foiled his plan and avenge the Jews from this would-be mass murderer and all his supporters. Aside from Torah, Esther is the Bible's best-known book among modern Jews. So it's Torah and the book of Esther. The rabbis wrote in the Talmud, those are 6,200 pages of Jewish writings, oral traditions and things of this nature. I don't necessarily read it, but I just want to tell you a quote from it. Ta'ani 29a, it says... From the beginning of Adar, that's the month that Purim falls out, we increase our happiness. Okay? That's how special Purim is. And it's always been special to me. I've been celebrating it since, since I've been in the womb, really. My mother was in synagogue and I was in her. Purim relates how Esther is drafted into King Ashaverus's beauty contest, all the while at her cousin's Mordecai, Mordecai's directive, keeping her religious origins a secret. A short time later, after Esther has won the contest and married the king, Mordecai infuriated Ashaverus' most powerful advisor, Haman, by refusing to bow before him. Haman considers it, some people here for the first time says, is this like an interactive theater piece? Are we going to have to get out of like a mystery box? We're not allowed to talk in church. So he refused to bow before him. Haman considers it beneath his dignity to wreak vengeance upon Mordecai alone. Instead, he concocts a plan to wipe out all the Jews. Using arguments that have remained part of the arsenal of anti-Semites ever since. 
Haman speaks to Ashaveros that the Jews were dangerous. By the way, the anti-Semites have been saying this for years. The Jews have left the blessing everywhere they've gone. A blessing everywhere they've gone. And guess what? They're the only people in history who's never tried to take over any land, just the land that God gave them, and they keep giving it up. So I don't know what empire you, you, you're, you know, you're reading about, but if you read about any other empire, they were just thieves, murderers, and greedy to take over land and money and power. Not Israel. The only one. Isn't it funny how every other empire people hold in high regard and this is the only empire who didn't do that and that everybody wants to kill? <laughs> so crazy. So, when the news of Haman's plot surfaces... Mordecai urges Esther to intervene with the king. Her first instinct is to refuse. To go to the king without being summoned, she informs her cousin is a capital crime, capital offense, death. Mordecai persists and Esther concedes. Even more than Pharaoh, Haman becomes for Jews the symbol of the Jew hater, the would-be Hitler of his day. That is why the retaliation carried out against him is so satisfying. Also, some of you might be thinking, why do you talk about Israel so much, Rabbi? First of all, we're a messianic congregation. Second of all, nobody else is. <laughs> I mean, some of you might be in church for 40 years and never heard a sermon on Esther. That's crazy. Did you say show is? Thank you. Thank you for reminding me I'm not in New York. I... Even more than Pharaoh, Haman becomes for Jews the symbol of the Jew hater, the would-be Hitler of his day. That is why the retaliation carried out against him is so satisfying. You know the Nuremberg trials in 46, when they hung some Nazi war criminals? Do you know they yelled out Purim Fest because they hung 10 of them and 10 of Haman's sons were hung? They knew about Purim. Mass murdering, genocide, you know, demonic people knew about Purim. But the church doesn't. Anyway, <laughs> Esther goes to Ashaviris and succeeds in turning him against his evil doer. Haman is hanged from the very gallows he set up for Mordecai. The Jews are saved, and Esther presumably lives happily ever after. Women as well as men are commanded to hear the public reading of the biblical scroll of Esther as a reminder to future generations of this incredible deliverance. Because there's going to come a time in the last days when all the nations are around her, and we want to keep telling, I want to keep telling my kids, if you're around that day, Fret not. Messiah's coming back to beat the crap out of them. He's, he's just waiting for that, you understand? He's waiting for them to cry out. Wasn't he waiting during the time of Pharaoh? It said they finally cried out, and the Lord heard their cries and responded. He's just waiting for them. We think he's coming back to take us on a magic carpet ride. First of all, you're not going out with Steppenwolf. It was not preached by Yeshua. It was not preached by the disciples. It was not preached by the early church. Why? Because it's not a legitimate teaching. It's a pre-wrath rapture. If you believe in a pre-trib rapture, it's not biblical, and your rapture theory is a rupture theory. You need to read the scriptures to get a theory and stop listening to somebody who just speaking to you. You need to read the book of Esther, not hear it from me. But now you're stuck, so listen up. <laughs> I want to just give you three. I know this is making some Baptists really happy. Three. <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't know where they get this from. It's like they go to seminary and they go, can't do four points. Can't do two. People will be very upset with you. Got to have a three-point sermon. What if, what if there's one more point? You know what? The heck with that. We're going to have four points. I'm, I'm making four points just to make a point. <laughs> All right, let's look at the first point. Don't redefine the Lord's commands. How's that? That will preach, huh? You don't really even need a sermon on that, do you? It's pretty straightforward. Don't redefine the Lord's commands. If he said something, don't carry it out in 90%, 98%, 99.9%. .9%. Just... You know, what do you, I don't understand. You know, people pray so much and they do so little. What are you praying about so much? 
Don't redefine the Lord's commands. Let me show you what I mean. Esther 3.1. And I'm not, you know, I can't go into too much detail. But it says, sometime later, after, after Mordecai heard about the plot, that's a sometime later. You know that sometime later is between three and five years, between chapter two and chapter three? Sometime later, people think, well, that's five minutes. Because they're so unskilled and unschooled in the word of God. Because all they heard all their life was rah, rah, sis, boom, ba. Man, what a shame. Three to five years. Three to five years. We know because we know what year that king was in his kingship. We know when he started his kingship based on Persian history. This is extra biblical evidence. It supports the Bible. <laughs> the people that say it was written by men, they've never really studied it. <laughs> Not the way it should be studied. They show their ignorance when they say that. Sometime later, ignorance isn't stupid. Stupid is stupid. Ignorance is ignoring the truth, making a conscious effort to ignore what's obvious. Sometime later, King Ahasuerus began to single out Haman, the son of Hamdata the Agagai, for advancement. Eventually, he gave him precedence over all his fellow officers. Haman is an Agagite. An Agagite, we know, is a descendant of the Amalekites. Who are the Amalekites? Descendants of Esau. They represent the flesh. They were supposed to be destroyed according to God, right? Yeah. But somebody redefined the Lord's commands. It was called King Saul, the king of Israel, no less. Who promoted Haman? Not Ashaviros, Satan himself. How, how could you say that? How could you say that? Because he wanted to kill all of God's chosen people. That's how I can say that. He wanted to exterminate, even if they weren't God's chosen people. Wouldn't you agree that anybody that wants to kill a whole group of people is probably satanic? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now let's see where the mishap happened. This is like 483 B.C. We're going to go moonwalk about 550 years back, okay, to about 1,000 B.C. when King Saul was ruling over Israel. 1 Samuel 15, 1 through 3, 7 through 9. You got it? Shmuel said to Shaul, why, why, do, why do we use this? Why do we use these words? Because you've looked at this thing through Greek eyes for too long. The whole Bible is written by Jews to a Jewish audience. You have to understand Jesus wasn't Jewish. He still is. He didn't convert. He's not a Methodist. He's not a Christian. He's the king of Israel. And when he comes back, he's coming back the king of Israel. I know somebody's saying, no, he was a non-denominationalist. I know it, right? It was like when I convinced the woman, two hours, I convinced her that Jesus was Jewish. She was a devout Catholic, and she said, but his parents were Catholic, right? <laughs> Bingo. You nailed it. Shmuel said to Shaul, Adonai sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now listen, 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 Shema. Shema doesn't mean to listen. Some of you are listening, but you don't hear me. Listen means to hear with the intent to obey whatever you hear. Now listen to what Adonai has to say. Here's what Adonai to vote. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of heaven's army says. Okay, he's, he's saying the Lord of heaven's armies because he wants him to know, hey, this is God. Okay? This is God. He's not your little buddy. He's not the big man upstairs. This is God, almighty God. And I'm a prophet speaking on his behalf. I remember what Amalek did to Israel. See, there it is. God keeps good records how they fought against Israel when they were coming up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and completely destroy everything they have. Now so many people have a problem with this. They're like, kill the men, the women, the children. I don't want to deal with that kind of God. Okay. First of all, when Yeshua comes back, it says that he's got fire in his eyes and a sword in his mouth and the blood will be up to the bridle of the horse. How do you think the blood's going to get up that high? And look what happened by not obeying. Look what ended up almost happening. We don't understand the mind of the Lord. It's best to just stop trying to figure it out and just obey for God's sakes. I mean, how are you doing with your life on your own? Not so great. Neither was I. By the way, I have a correction. Did you hear me say that, um, that um, none of my friends ever paid me back when I lent money? Early on, I just got a text from a buddy in Oregon. He watches. He said, I, it took me like 15 years, but I paid you back. <laughs> so I just, I just want to be honest. 
You might say, why did you have to say that? Because you have to be honest. Because otherwise you're a liar. Now go and attack Amalek and completely destroy everything. Don't spare them. Kill the men, the women, the children, the babies, the cows, the sheep, the camels, and the donkeys. Then Shaul attacked Amalek. So he listened, kind of. From Havilah and continuing towards Shur at the border of Egypt. He went all the way down to the border of Egypt. He took Agag, the king of Amalek. Agag is a title, like Pharaoh. It's not a religion, it's a title. He took him alive. What? Did he obey God? No, no. But he completely destroyed. He, he, he did it like 99.9%. That's pretty good, right? I mean, you're either pregnant or you're not. You can't be 99.9% pregnant, right? But he completely destroyed the people, putting them to the side. However, Shaul and the people spared Agag. Now, what do we know about this? Obviously, this guy had sex with somebody. And then that somebody had sex with somebody. And that somebody had sex with somebody. And they gave birth to Haman. And what did Haman almost do? He almost destroyed the Jewish people. Guess what? What's the big deal, Rabbi? No Jews, no Jesus. So he almost foiled God's plan of redemption. It's a big deal. The biggest deal. Little sins can lead to major consequences. Saul was on a downward spiral here. He was always falling short of complete obedience. I, I, I did everything except. And this is one of the classics in the Word of God, not the Old Testament. I talk the Word of God. 1 Samuel 15, 22. Shmuel said, does Adonai take as much pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying what Adonai says? I got news for you. Billy Graham didn't get into heaven because of what he did. He got into heaven because he was wearing the garment of salvation. There were some mistakes Brother Billy made. I don't know if you know about the tapes in 1960, but he admitted it was very sad. It was a sad part in his life. I don't want to talk badly about the man because he was unbelievable, but he said some awful things about the Jewish people. Just got awful. He was on tape and he admitted to Newsweek and he said, I said, the Jews think I like them. I never liked them. Anti-Semitism is in the fiber of the church. Even when it's insidious and subtle. He said it was the biggest mistake he ever made when he was close to Nixon. But with that being said, I just want to show you even one of the greatest men of God that ever lived still falls short. Because the greatest of men are men at best. And he knew that he was going to get into heaven based upon the robe of righteousness that was given to him through the sacrifice of the king of Israel. See, the problem is there are Christians who love Israel because it's like the right thing to do. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But you can actually love Israel and not like Jews. Yeshua didn't like Israel. Yeshua didn't like Italy. He liked Jews and Italians. God so loved the world. He didn't die for nations. He died for people. Don't ever forget it. Surely obeying is better than sacrifice and heeding orders than the fat of rams. What does this tell us? Obedience first, obedience last, obedience always, end of story. You ready for another point? Okay. Let's look at another point. Divine providence and sovereignty. That's a fancy theological word. If any of you went to a cemetery, I mean a seminary, you've heard these words constantly. Little children don't know them. Most adults don't know them. It just means God's care. God's care and his power. Some people call it that he's sovereign. He's the boss. God does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, where he wants, to whom he wants, whenever he wants, and he's not going to consult with anyone. Who do you think you are? God? Divine providence and sovereignty, or God is large in charge and in total control. Okay, let's look at some scriptures. Esther 3, 2, 5, and 6. 
All the king's servants at the king's gate would kneel and bow down before Haman because the king had so ordered. It wasn't so much Haman's order, it was the king's order. But Mordecai would neither kneel nor bow down to him. Why would he not bow down? Worship the Lord your God and him only. Real simple. Amen. Yeshua just repeated it, right? When the enemy came in him, bow down to me and I'll give you all these kingdoms. Could he? Yes. He's the God of this world. When you serve the world, you serve Satan. Make no mistake. Amen. Sorry. <laughs> That's the truth. He's the God of this world. He could have gave it to him, but it was time wasn't right. And he said, no, you shall bow down to the Lord your God and him only, right? So Mordecai was doing a great job. Haman was furious when he saw that Mordecai was not kneeling and bowing to him. However, on learning what people Mordecai belonged to, it seemed to him a waste. You know, why should I just kill Mordecai? Why don't I kill all the Jews in 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia? Let's kill every single one. Rather, he decided to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole of Ahasuerus' kingdom. Haman was under the influence of the spirit of the Antichrist. When you are anti-Semitic, you are under the spirit of the Antichrist. Period. Rabbi, that can't be. Well, you tell me what spirit it is then. Is it the spirit of God? There's only two spirits. <laughs> There's the Holy Spirit and the unholy spirit. There's not a third choice. This isn't let's make a deal. There's only two. Why, why, why is this spirit have been around forever? Kill the Jews, kill the Jews, kill the Jews. Because look at the first prophecy way back in the beginning, Genesis 3.15. Do we have it? I will put, this is God speaking, animosity, hatred, extreme hatred between you, Satan, and the woman. Who's the woman? We know from Revelation 12, it's Israel. How do we know that? Between your descendant and her descendant, or some of your, or some of your uh, versions say her seed and your seed. First of all, seed is plural or singular? Some of you are like, I don't want to say it because I don't know. There's no S. Seeds would be plural. Seed is singular. And if you look up seed in the Hebrew language that this is written in, it speaks about semen. A woman doesn't have semen. She doesn't have a seed. She has an egg. So who is he speaking to? He's speaking that the Holy Spirit, God, will come over you and birth the Messiah. Wow, that's deep. That's just reading it and looking up a couple of words. So there's going to be this hatred between the devil and his seed, the Antichrist, and the woman and her seed, or the Christ, right? This is what it's all about, guys. This spiritual war going on for your soul and your decision-making, your will, every minute of the day. Every minute of the day. And it says, he will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. You, Satan, will bruise his heel, a death blow, but not end up in ultimate death but you will crush his head. It will end up in ultimate defeat. So if I'm the devil and I know this prophecy way back, what do I want to do? I want to get to the woman. I want to kill the Jews so the golden child isn't born. This sounds sci-fi. If you would ever really take time to read the Bible, you'd be so into it. Of course, it's the coolest book ever. With everything, espionage and murder and mayhem, yeah. mystery. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. But you read that crap. What well, I don't even know what it is, but it's junk. Yeah. Fiction. This is true, man. Yeah. It's true. So the devil was after her. Got to kill all the Jews, man. The golden child can't be born. Look at Genesis 3, uh, Esther 3, 7. It says, in the first month... They started casting lots. Lot, lots, like almost like dice, if you will. Poor. Poor, P-U-R, is lots, and the plural is Purim. That's where they get the name from. So in the first month, the month of Nisan, that's the first month of the Jewish calendar, or God's calendar, rather. In the 12th year, so we know where we're talking about, he started his reign in 4, 
85, so you just go 12 years in. They began throwing poor, that is, casting lots before Haman every day and every month until the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. Isn't that cool that God gave the Jewish people a whole year to prepare? Rabbi, this is, this is the, you're, you're out of your mind. True. True. I am out of my mind. There's no question about it. But this is by chance. You roll the dice. That's chance. God has nothing to do with that. Oh, silly human being. God has something to do with everything. You don't know who God is, do you? You really think you're, you're, you're pulling the strings? You think you're making the decisions? Oh, wow. That's like when I put my hand on the chess piece. Do you think it's saying to me where it's going to move? Oh, in, in the Old Testament times, this system was used to determine the will of God. At times, they used this system. But let's look at what Proverbs says, 1633. One can cast lots into one's lap, but the decision comes from the Lord. <laughs> Nobody can thwart God's will. Rabbi, what if the reigning king is bent on evil? What if he's just evil personified? Let's go to Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is in Adonai's hand. Like streams of water, he directs it wherever he pleases. So you're telling me, just as the channel directs the flow of water, Rabbi, so the Lord rules and overrules the king's thoughts and actions? Rabbi, are you sure? Let's go to Proverbs 21.30. No wisdom, discernment, or counsel succeeds against the Lord. Man is powerless to outsmart God. When it comes to wisdom and understanding and strategy, no plan shall avail against the Lord. You know what I say? Man's plans, garbage cans. Make your plans. Go ahead. I'm going to live here, then I'm going to go there, then I'm going to retire this, and I'm going to put away this, and I'm going to go here. Wow, I should worship you. You got it all figured out. It's okay to make plans, but listen, life throws a lot of curveballs. You know? My plan was I was going to put away a million dollars by the time I was 30, and I was on that. I was definitely not going to get married and have kids. I was going to get 10% from an investment, an offshore investment in the Caribbean. I was going to move to Florida, and I was going to hang out and party my life away till I dropped dead. How did I do? Not so great. Okay, so point one, don't redefine the Lord's commands. Point two, divine providence and sovereignty. Point three, human responsibility. See, Rabbi, you just said God's in control of everything. Now you're saying human responsibility? Yes. See, God's providence and sovereignty does not negate human responsibility. There's a divine side and there's a human side. Let's look at the human side to this equation, if you will. Esther 2, 19, 21, and 23. It says, when the girls would gather, on other occasions, Mordecai would sit at the king's gate. On one of those occasions, just happens to be, you know, he just happens to be sitting there. When Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, two of the king's officers, Bichtan and Teresh, from the group in charge of the private entryways, why were they in charge of the private entryways? This is where the harem, the girls from the harems are coming. What did Big Ten and Teresh have in common? They were eunuchs. Why do you get eunuchs to watch over the girls? Do I have to explain that? <laughs> Big Ten and Teresh, Rabbi, don't talk about these things. We don't want our kid to learn. We want our kid to learn from other students, and then when she gets knocked up, we'll try to hide her away. Grow up. Talk about it maturely and honestly and openly. Because they're going to hear it from somebody else and you don't want them to get their sex education from the street. That's where I got mine. It did not work out well. But they're your kids. Do what you want. I'm going to preach it and you'll have to deal with it. <laughs> from the group in charge of the private entryways, they became angry and conspired to assassinate King Ahasuerus. I mean, I know if he turned me into a eunuch, I might want to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> that's, that's not a that's not a separate point. That's just I'm just throwing that in there. Put that in your pocket, and on the way home, lady, you'll pull it out and have a good laugh. But Mordecai learned about it and told Esther the queen. 
The matter was investigated, found to be true, and both were hanged on a stake. If it wasn't bad enough, right? All this was recorded in the daily journal that was kept with the king. Imagine that in his chronicles. The king always had chronicles. You'll read about it in chronicles, about other kings who had chronicles. We don't know where they are, but I'm sure somebody's going to find them. They always do. And whoever writes that chronicle is going to make a billion dollars because people always want to learn about secret stuff. There's no secret. Mm -mm. All the secrets are told. Read Ephesians. I will. All right, so yes, Mordecai was in the right place at the right time, right? He was definitely in the right place, but he had to act. What if he didn't say anything? There would be no story of Esther. There'd be no story of Yeshua. There'd be no redemption. There'd be no monotheism. There'd be no Bible. There'd be no Yeshua. The Jews gave us monotheism. We'd be polytheistic. We'd believe in a million gods. We'd be cutting our kids and throwing them to the fire. Aren't you happy for the Jews? So he had to act. Look, Esther 4, 10 through 11. Then Esther spoke to Hatach and gave him this message for Mordecai. All the king's officials as well as the people in the royal provinces know it's public knowledge that if anyone, man or woman, it doesn't matter, even me, the queen, approaches the king in the inner courtyard without being summoned, there's just one law. He must be put to death. I mean, this is a big gamble. It says unless the king holds out his gold scepter for him to remain alive, but that ha he hasn't summoned. I haven't been summoned. She wasn't summoned for 30 days. It's been a month. What do you think she's thinking? She's going to go in the inner courtyard. He never summoned her. And she's dying. And she's thinking, I don't want to die. You can understand, right? Yeah. It's easy for us to say, oh, I would go. Sure you would. <laughs> sure you would. Of course. It's a capital offense. Death. And she hasn't seen him for 30 days. So she's thinking, uh, no. I'm not doing it. Mm -mm. So let's go a few verses down, 12 to 14. It says, upon being told what Esther had said, Mordecai asked them to give Esther this answer. So it comes back to Mordecai. She's not doing it. And this is what Mordecai says. Hey, Essie, don't suppose this is her cousin. Don't su and he raised her. By the way, she was an orphan. So they were tight. She adored him. Don't suppose that merely because you happen to be in the royal palace, you will escape any more than the other Jews. Right. You're not safe. No one is. For if you fail to speak up now, relief and deliverance will come to the Jews. You follow? It's, if you don't speak up, we're done. No, no. God's never done. God's never done. And if ain't you, he'll get somebody else. Don't give yourself that much credit. For if you fail to speak up now, right now, relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from a different direction, but you and your father's family will perish. You'll die. They'll ultimately get delivered. Maybe a few months in, but you're going to die. Who knows whether you didn't come into... How many times have you heard that? <laughs> Preached out of context. <laughs> yeah, you've come to the world for such a time as this. What, what are you doing? Tell me, what's so important that the world can't live without you? This is a big deal. This is a big deal. So, he's like, speak up, Essie. You've got to speak up. Why? We sung a song today, for Zion's sake, I will not be silent. It's Isaiah 62, prophetically, about how all Israel is going to be saved. You know when it says, for Zion's sake, I will not be silent? You know who the I is? It's either the Lord or Messiah. I say it's both because they're one and the same. Yeah. So, if, if Yeshua himself won't be silent over Zion. Why are you so quiet over her? Isn't that crazy that you could love Jesus and yet not love what he's in love with? How does that happen? I'll tell you how it happens because the enemy is brilliant. You cannot thwart the enemy. You have to know the truth in order to know what's counterfeit. And that takes time in the word, not time on the internet. Reading some stupid theology from some imbecile in his basement look at this quote you've heard this quote a million times the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing 
Now, I always, when I quote anybody, I always give them the credit, always, 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 never once did not. However, we don't know who this quote is from. Some say it's that Irish statesman, Edmund Burke, 1770, but he didn't exactly say this. Some say this British philosopher, John Stuart Mill, in 1878. Some say Charles Frederick Aked, a prominent preacher from London, 1920. The fact is they've said derivatives of this, but this statement is so true. Do you know that today when a woman is being beaten, sometimes even raped in public, they take out their cameras and film it, but they don't get involved? <sighs> what kind of society we live in, man? The only thing necessary for evil to triumph, succeed, is for good men to do nothing. And believe me, we have a lot of good men and good women doing nothing. How many Bible studies can you go to before you decide to do something with what you're learning? Now, I'm not saying that everybody that goes to a Bible study doesn't do anything. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just saying sometimes the scales are really tipped in the other way. This is how it happens. So Esther 4, 15, 16, what happens? Esther had them return this answer to Mordecai. Go and assemble all the Jews to be found in Shushan. And have them fast for me, neither eating nor drinking for three days, night and day. Also, I and the girls attending me will fast the same way. Then I will go into the king, which is against the law. But if I die, I die. It's the right thing to do. Prayer and fasting are good and right. But we need to put legs on our prayers. Point four, my favorite point. The absurdity of wickedness, or as I call it, the divine boomerang. Okay, Esther 7, 9 through 10. Harvona, one of the king's attendants, said, Look, the gallows, 70 feet, 75 feet high that Haman made for, for Mordecai. One of the most astounding things in the story uh, you've probably read it a million times, but, and, and I'm sure you didn't really necessarily miss it, but you ever see in, in chapter 5 when um, Esther has favor with the king, of course, and he says, what, what can I give to you, even up to half your kingdom? And she says, I just would like you and your associate, your right-hand man, to come to a dinner that I prepare, right? And then at the dinner, he says again, Essie, my love, what do you want? I'd give you half the kingdom. And she asks for another dinner. You ever wonder why she just didn't tell him at the first dinner? Just tell him at the first dinner that Haman's trying to kill all your people. Because he would have sided with Haman. It was during that night and the next night, that night according to the Bible, that the king had insomnia. Just so happens. And, and, and what does he ask for? His chronicles, because he knows that his life is a sleeper. So bring me my chronicles, and I'll fall asleep. And they just happen to open up to where Mordecai saved his life. And then he says, what have, I, what have you done for him? Nothing. And he's like, wow, Mordecai, the Jews saved my life. The Jews. And that's when he came the next night for the banquet. Do you see how stunning God is? Do you see how crazy the story is? Isn't that exciting? See, the whole idea was that you would leave with more faith today. That was the idea, that this would be a faith injection. Crazy. Isn't, isn't it wonderful that King Ahasuerus couldn't sleep? But isn't it even more wonderful that we have a king that doesn't sleep? That's scriptural, by the way. The king of Israel doesn't slumber nor sleep. It's... Harvona, one of the king's attendants, said, look, the gallows, 75 feet high that Haman made for Mordecai. You know, he was such a typical, such a little whiner, you know. He had everything. He went to the banquet, came home to his wife, such a little whiner. You know, some men are just little whiners. The wife has to take control because they're such little whiners. Uh, I went to the dinner, and, and she invited me to the dinner, but Mordecai won't bow down to me. But if you read the story, his wife said, look, they're Jews, and you come against them, you're coming against God. Even his wife had it figured out. By the same token, let me not make this out, that 
it was just all fun and games. Because as far as I'm concerned, as a die, died in the wool Jew, there's, there's been many a Haman and only one Purim. According to demographers, there should be 350 million of us. There's 14 million. The worst, most horrific atrocities by men of religion. Men of religion, sadly enough. That's the worst part. So the gallows is 75 feet high. Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke only good for the king, is standing at Haman's house. The king said, hang him on it. Imagine that. The divine boomerang. He throws, he throws, right? I'm going to kill, I'm going to kill Mordecai. I built this Mordecai. <laughs> Listen, guys, there's a divine boomerang with the Jewish people. I have a good friend, Dean Hahn, one of my two friends in ministry. He's in Northeast Tennessee. He was a pastor of a very huge church. Huge in Jonesboro, huge. And he went to Israel in 95, and he saw it, man. I, I think he's got Jewish blood because he was adopted, but that's just my, my feeling. He's too, he's too in love with the Jewish people. He adores them. His ministry in Tennessee is so blessed. It is so unbelievably blessed. I mean, when they wanted to redo the church, they needed 900 grand. They got it in an hour. He, it's so blessed. He's right now in Israel touring around senators. Senators, man, and preaching to them. And if you ask him, why are you so blessed? Although he's a wonderful man, why are you so blessed? He says, I preach about Israel every sermon. Something about Israel. He said, it's Genesis 12, 3, Rabbi. I said, I know. Why do you get it? And so few do. You're an anomaly. He said, I don't know. They're blinded. So the king said, hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. Imagine that. Haman took Mordecai's place on the gallows. Boomerang! Esther 8, 1 through 2. That same day, King Ahasuerus gave the house of Haman. It must have been a beautiful house, right? You're the right-hand man of the king. 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. Guy was a multi-mega billionaire. Do you know what kind of house he lived in? Did you see the party he had? 12 months! That guy knew how to party. Goblets made out of 24 karat gold, and each goblet was different. Couches, mosaics. I mean, the guy was like a gazillionaire, one of the richest men ever. So his right-hand man must have had a nice crib. But guess what? This poor schnook, right? The house of Haman, the enemy. This poor orphan, this poor Jewish orphan gets Haman's house. Also, Mordecai appeared before the king, for Esther revealed his relationship to her. This is my cousin. He raised me. I love him. The king removed his signet ring. Get out of town! Which he had taken back from Haman and gave it to Mordecai. You're now in charge. Everybody will bow to you. Whatever you say goes. <laughs> then Esther put Mordecai in charge of Haman. Is this beautiful? Yeah. Guys, I get it. Rabbi, you're a rabbi. You're a Jew. Your last name is Hirschberg. What's wrong with you? You have been grafted into the Commonwealth of Israel. Their history is your history. Get excited for God's sakes. But Rabbi, I've been marinated my whole life to not believe this. Well, unmarinate. How can you deny the flippant truth? Why are you fighting it? Rabbi, I don't really like Jews. And there's some people that might not blacks in here. And there's some people that might not like whites. You know what? Get with God and cry out and get changed for God's sakes. Yeah. <sighs> Haman's house was given to Esther and Haman's position was given to Mordecai. Another boomerang. Esther 8, 15 through 16. Meanwhile, Mordecai left the king's presence arrayed in royal blue and white. Blue and white, huh? How significant is that? Colors of Israel? Blue represents that Messiah is the son of God from the skies. White represents that he's the son of man, pure and perfect. Wearing a large gold crown represents deity in a robe of fine linen, purity and purple majesty. And the city of Shushan shouted for joy. 
for the Jews all were light, gladness, joy, and honor. Can you imagine? Mordecai, just a little bit ago, was in sackcloth. He leaves his sackcloth for robes of splendor. And the Jews went from potential decimation to out and out celebration. Boomerang. <laughs> Esther 912. The time approached for the king's order and decree to be carried out. The day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to overpower them. He could not rescind. Listen, he couldn't just send notices, edicts, and say, no, you can't attack them anymore. Why? Because your word is your bond. You can't take it back. Be careful before you speak. Be careful, boys. Say, yes, Rabbi, I'll, I'll be here tomorrow at 9. Oh, something came up. Yeah, you thought it through. Think before you talk. The time approached for the king's order and the decree to be carried out, the day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to overpower them. But as it turned out, get ready for the boomerang. The opposite took place. The Jews overpowered those who hated them. By the way, when I was preaching in Australia, I tried to throw that boomerang so many times, it never came back to me. <laughs> but there was a guy who lived in the outback, and I'm telling you, it was unbelievable what he could do with that boomerang. Thus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, that's where we're in right now, the month of Adar, the Jews assembled in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to attack anyone who tried to do them harm, and no one was able to withstand them because all the peoples were afraid of them. Why were they so afraid? Because God is God. Because God can do anything. He's not going to rescind his word. He's not going to break his covenants. He's not going to turn back on his promises. He's not going to turn away from his people. For Zion's sake, he will not be silent. This is good, right? Yes, sir. Very good. Not, not, not good. I'm, I'm saying this is good. I love the word of God. I'm not sure. You could say this too. This is unbelievable. So instead of the Jewish people becoming victims, they became victors. Boomerang. It even says that a lot of the people became Jews. Why do you want me to become a Gentile? Why do you want me to celebrate feasts that aren't even the Bible? Why do you want me to do that? I'm not, look, you do whatever you have to do. Listen to me. If, if you're a group, let's say, that you work on the weekends, and you want to meet once a week to honor God, right? And let's say it works. Let's say your waiters or waitresses. I don't know. But you've got to work on weekends. So you decide Tuesday night you're going to meet and worship God. Is there any foul or violation with that? No. The foul and the violation is when you say that Tuesday is the new Sabbath. Guys, you could meet Sunday all day long. I have no problem. I could care less, but it's not the Sabbath, and it wasn't changed. Read your history and find out how it was changed, so just don't call it the new Sabbath. That's all, and then you're good to go. Eat what you want. Celebrate whatever you want. I don't care. Just don't tell me I can't. Because not only do I have to, according to this, I want to. I enjoy it. so much crazy teaching that went on for 1900 years there's so much to correct and people don't want to correct don't tell me the truth <laughs> don't tell me the truth because then I might have to do something about it right. well I, rabbi I know it's the truth but heck we've been doing it for so long but you sound like a moron <laughs> seriously is that what you want to say to Jesus I know or Saul well I know you wanted me to kill all of them but heck I've been you know only obeying you 90% of the time the whole time I'm going to change now. Yeah. Rabbi, you say crazy things. I have to say crazy things to make a point. I have to. It's crazy to me. How are we going to become one if everybody's doing different stuff? He'll be back soon. He'll teach us for a thousand years. Yeah. Esther 9, 20 through 22. Mordecai recorded these events and sent letters to all the Jews in the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, instructing them to observe the 14th day of the month of Adar and the 15th day every year to commemorate the days on which the Jews obtain rest. Now you might say, wait a minute. This was Mordecai's doing. Was he, was he anointed? Did it come from the Lord? Listen, in Acts 15 of the Jerusalem Council, did it come from the Lord when Paul said, it is in my estimation what I think we should do? Read it. 
You, 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 when in Acts 15, he had to start somewhere. These were, these were, these were crazy pagan people. Right. Having sex with their kids, having sex with their animals. Yes. They were crazy. So he said, how are we, the people of God, going to sit with them? They're drinking blood. I've been to places where I, I sat with them as they drank blood. The Maasai tribe in Kenya. So he had to get on some firm ground where we can just have some table fellowship. So he gave them like four laws where they can sit. And then he said, They'll, we'll teach them. That's what it says, right? All right. Where was I before you rudely interrupted me? Ah, the 15th day every year to commemorate the days on which the Jews obtained rest from their enemies and the month which for them was turned, see the boomerang, from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday. They were to make them days of celebrating and rejoicing, sending portions of food to each other, giving gifts to the poor. Whenever we have a holiday... It's just not about us. We look to take care of the poor, too. We don't want our holidays to be self-centered. Oh, I'm blessed. Too blessed to be stressed. You ever see those people? You come up to them, you try to tell them your woes, and they're like, I don't want to hear it. I'm too blessed to be stressed. <laughs> Good for you. Sorrow into gladness, mourning into joy, boomerang. So before we close, yeah, we got to close. Got to get out of here. Let's do a quick recapitulation of the Feast of Purim. Recapitulation of the Feast of Purim. One, don't redefine God's commands. Two, God is providential and sovereign. Three, God's providence and sovereignty does not negate human responsibility. And wickedness is absurd. Now let me give you the Greg Hirschberg version. Esther recap. Little sins can lead to major consequences. God is large and charged and in total control. you got to put legs on your prayers. And when it comes to the Jewish people, beware of the divine boomerang. Yeah, have some fun in here. Okay, let's conclude. There is a certain feature to the book of Esther that has troubled Jewish and Christian readers alike. There is no mention of God. There's nowhere to be found. Name isn't spoken. This is true. However, God is the author of all history, even if he does not sign his name to the bottom of every page. Even if God's name is not explicitly associated with those who voluntarily stayed in Babylon, the Jews, instead of returning to their city in the land, Israel, his care for them cannot be questioned. They were still his people, and he would protect them. So although God may appear to be invisible at times, God is invincible all the time. Let's stand together. I'll give you one last verse. A nice little one-sentence doxology. So to the king! eternal, indestructible, and invisible, the only God there is, let there be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. That is some of Purim's principles. There's many others. You'll find tons if you spend some time reading it, actually reading the Bible. And um, golly, you're so sarcastic. Yes, I am. And so is Yeshua when he said, how do you see a speck in your brother's eye when you got a plank in yours? He used a lot of sarcasm and hyperbole on a regular basis. That's why I know he's Jewish. Um, <laughs> next week, it's not going to be a pretty message. I'm sorry. So if you don't like non-pretty messages, I would not come. It's going to be another poor message, but it's going to be more prophetic. And um, we're going to have to deal with some, some issues some insidious issues. And so uh, they're true. Uh, sometimes they're hard for some people to hear, but I would appreciate if you can hear them, and if they're not biblical, then you can just say, hey, that's not biblical, and listen with one ear and let it go. But I can assure you I feel very strong about this prophetic message about Purim and the modern-day Hamans that are among us. So we'll take care of that next week. Purim is this Wednesday. Next week there's going to be a play. There's going to be a Torah parsha. Um, there's going to be a lot of humitation for all the kids. It should be a blast. And if you want, um, yeah, uh, Jewish Halloween is Purim, by the way. We, we dress our kids up because we want them. See, the reason why kids walk around here, believe it or not, is we want them to think that God actually likes them. So, so next week, if your kids like to dress up, you know, dress them up. Just don't dress them like Haman, okay? That, that, that <laughs> your kid might get beat up. But, um, yeah, anyway. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you.
And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Chag Sameach. Have a good Purim this week.